say it earlier if I missed you, uh, happy Father's Day. Um, I will let our men know that uh, we have one of the greatest gifts that we receive here as fathers. Like there's been some years where we would get like a candy bar and things like that because, well, because I didn't think ahead and I was trying to figure out what to buy uh, the other fathers on Saturday night. But um, for the past couple of years, we've had the, the Landises making their soap. And if you know, if you've had this soap, then you, you know. Like, it is the most amazing bar soap that I've ever had. Um, grease from working on my car with Ron Croker, and he has it, and it just comes right off. Um, you know, grime from cleaning my, my garage, and I go and wash with it, and it comes right off, and it smells good. It doesn't smell like girls um, <laughs> like it's just really good soap so thank you uh, Chad and the Landises for uh, guys make sure you pick up a bar as you leave um, and it's, uh, it's our way of saying uh, happy Father's Day so I wanted to explain uh, I'm, I'm double mic'd here today I really, really struggled with this sermon this week. Typically, I try to have the sermon written the absolute latest by Thursday so that I can record and edit on Friday. Well, I didn't finish writing this particular sermon until about four or five in the afternoon yesterday. So I went outside to record uh, late, after, late afternoon, early evening, and I'm, I'm recording and everything's going well. I'm about 25% of the way into the sermon and I feel a sneeze coming on. There were bugs all over. They kept flying up my nose and everything else. And so I feel the sneeze coming on. And so I figure, well, people don't need to hear me sneeze. So I reached down to mute my microphone. And then I forgot to turn it back on. So I, I, I'm so glad, like I got the sermon recorded. I'm like, all right, now I can get the, this edited, get it uploaded, and, and I could be done with the online part of it. I sit down at the computer and I'm listening and I'm like, where's the audio for the last part? And I followed the audio line to where it went out. I'm like, the sneeze. So we're recording it right now, uh, and so it's not available online right now. And if this works well, then this will probably become the, uh, what we do until we can have the live stream up and running. So if this works well, then that means that our videos will not be available anymore in the morning. They, it wouldn't be until like later in the afternoon on Sunday that those would um, be uploaded. So. I would ask you now to uh, join me in prayer as we turn to this message. God, I do want to pray that these words um, would be of you. God, that they would be life-giving, that they would be life-changing, that they would be challenging and encouraging, Lord. I thank you that you know where each and every one of our hearts lie with you and with one another. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak directly to where each and every one of us are. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified and that um, you would be pleased with the ministry that occurs here throughout the rest of our time as we are gathered. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So I want to take you on a tour of our refrigerator. I, I was going to take a picture of it, but I knew my wife would not appreciate me taking a picture of our refrigerator. So I'm instead going to take you on a verbal tour of our refrigerator. When you first open up the doors, your eyes go immediately to the big shelf. The big shelf is where all the important stuff is. You know, the milk, the Diet Coke, the big container of leftovers, large bowl of fruit, right there front and center as soon as you open the refrigerator. We then have this like random assortment of, of small things on the top shelf, the, the dips, containers of sour cream for Taco Tuesdays, that sort of thing. So when you open up the door and you look to your right, that's the hall of condiments. 
Now, some people, and it's funny because Nicole had no idea I was going to talk about this today, and she made a remark yesterday about why are there so many condiments in our refrigerator. Some people are happy with just ketchup and mustard, but not the Dreyer family. When I make a burger, I tend to find whatever condiments I can find, and it's on there. So ketchup, mustard, steak sauce, hot sauce, ranch to dip it in, Miracle Whip, whatever's available, I'm like, throw it on. Let, let's make this, you know, a really good, like, confusing tasting kind of burger. And don't even get me started on my hot sauce. American hot sauce, Mexican hot sauce, Asian hot sauce, Indian hot sauce, Creole hot sauce, spicy barbecue, all sorts of different uh, hot sauces. And most of that is because of you people. Uh, at Christmas, I'll have a few of you that give me gifts of like 20 different kinds of hot sauces. And so they all, you know, I, I, I like hot sauce, but I can't eat all of it. And so they all sit there for a while as I go through the hot sauces. So, typically what ends up happening, I open the door and then I stand there frozen for like 30 seconds because there are so many condiments, they all kind of start to blend together. together. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm talking about? Like, like I know I'm looking for this one particular hot sauce or condiment, but I can't see it because they're all there together and I just don't notice it. I want to share another phenomenon that, that speaks to the same thing of the condiments all blending together. The year that our oldest son Caleb was born, I went through a big professional change. Uh, I went from serving as a youth pastor at a church in the country to being an alternative education teacher for kids who were kicked out of their home school districts due to their behavior. So I went from dealing with youth group kids with a decent family structure to kids with no family, no support, no hope. Now before I could start working, I had to go through some training. In fact, if you remember way back to 2003, the night the lights went out on the East Coast, do you guys remember that? It was like August and it was like the entire East Coast lost um, electricity that night. That's the night that I was in my training. And so we're, we're in the classroom, and you were talking about, I don't know, coping mechanisms and learning styles, how to de-escalate a student. After all the classroom stuff, we move over to the gym for a surprise. I'm thinking, cool, ice cream or you know, something like that. Before I could teach in the classroom, I needed to learn how to restrain a kid without hurting him or her. I thought to myself, come on, seriously, how often am I going to have to do this in an alternative education program? Well, my first week of classes, I probably got in the middle of about 10 fights. And I had to stop them by myself because I was the only teacher in there. And I remember after that first week going to my boss and being like, you know what, I'm done. Who, this is ridiculous. Who would want to work in an environment like this? He talked me into staying, and by Halloween I had seen so many fights, it was no longer shocking to me. Um, I, I had become so used to it to the point where I was like, oh, look, a fight. In fact, some of the kids, they, the one, this one kid... Um, he and I had a relationship where I could like joke with him and he got into a fight and I didn't break it up right away and he's like Mr. Dreyer why didn't you break it up and I'm like because you deserved it <laughs> and I was joking but I also kind of meant it um, you know like sometimes we just need punched in the mouths you know at least I did when I was that age the thing is whether we are talking about something as innocuous as condiments or dangerous as kids fighting. When we are exposed to something often, we tend to become unaware of it. It stops shocking us. It no longer affects us the way that it should or it once did. So today, um, continuing our series titled Go There. And in this series, we're talking about different matters that our church and our society faces right now. Throughout the rest of the summer, just a quick rundown we're going to deal with subjects like social media and the internet. 
uh, war, health, the end times, heaven and hell. You know what? I'm speaking on the end times in two weeks. And after the past three sermons, I can't wait to talk about something as controversial as the end times. Um, we're going to talk about heaven and hell and gender issues and sexuality, marriage and divorce, life and death, gifts of the Spirit, and anything else that might come up. Last week I spoke about politics and how our hope lies ultimately in Jesus Christ. The previous week I spoke about some of the issues that our own denomination faces and how and why denominations even exist in the first place. This week I'm going to speak about a matter that hits very close to home for our church. Just over a year ago Many people in our country saw something that brought about a change in our ability to see something up to that point. Many of us were blind to it because it was all around us. I remember sitting on my couch watching the news and seeing George Floyd lying on the ground with his murderer's knee on his neck for over eight minutes. And during this time, the other cops who were gathered around him doing nothing to stop the killing of this man right there in front of us. And I and many others that I know, we saw something in that moment that changed us. So after that, I began to have some, some different conversations with those around me, both black and white people. Some of those conversations were to help me with understanding. Some were, were showing care and concern. Some were easy to have, others were challenging. Some were confrontational, but for different reasons. And it was in those conversations that I began to see the need for not just a sermon on the topic, but a willingness to talk about these things, whether in a sermon or outside of, of a uh, sermon. But before I get to the actual message, let me first read this statement in order for all of us to remember why it is that we are giving uh, these messages throughout this summer. I am preaching this sermon not because I have it all figured out, not because I think it is fun to possibly offend your beliefs or practices, and not because I simply seek to cause drama. I am preaching this sermon for three reasons. One, because it is important for Christians to know that God does not shy away from the controversial subjects, but instead speaks directly into them. Two, oftentimes God's ways are counter to what our society accepts as the norm. And three, because we honor God by walking faithfully in His ways, which are everlasting, rather than running blindly hand in hand with the world whose ways are as changing as the wind. So what I want to do today is um, look to scripture to see what God thinks of race and racism and then talk about what we as Christians should and could do about it. And to get to that point I want to look at three different times in which race is brought up in relation to something that Jesus did or said. So the first story we're going to look at is the one of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. And in order to really understand this story, we have to do a little bit of reading in between the lines. And we also have to know the history of the Samaritan people. The Samaritans were of, of Hebrew origin. And then when, when the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians, those people were taken away, forced to intermarry with the Assyrians, and then after a few generations, they were allowed to come back, but now they were known as Samaritans. And because of their history, they were viewed by the Jewish people of the south as kind of like a half-breed. And this caused many Hebrews to not want to even run the risk of being associated with any Samaritan. And so we see a verse like John 4.4, 4, where Jesus, uh, it says that he had to travel through Samaria. Now, people didn't do that back then, though. You see, the Samaritans, if you were here and you, and you needed to get here, and you were a, a God-fearing Jew, you would go around Samaria. You wouldn't go through it, even though this journey was much easier. You would show your 
holiness, I guess, and your distaste of the Samaritans by going around them and completely avoiding them. So Jesus is traveling through the area and he comes to a well around noon. The town that Jesus was in was called Sychar. It's modern day Nablus. Now, the weather there is one of those places where it's like as close to perfect as you can get in this world. The high average in August gets to about 85 degrees. And it's kind of like that for a lot of the year. So while that might be warm for an average, it's not like you know the places around it that's surrounded by, by desert. But 85 degrees, 2,000 years ago, is still a little warm. And so Jesus heads to the well at noon for a reason. Typically, the only other people who would be at a well at 12 o'clock noon would be those who did not want to associate with anyone. But Christ goes there for a reason, with a uh, specific purpose. And so he goes and talks to this woman, which is, again, another point of significance. So much so that in John 4, 27, we read this. Just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Like, holy cow, Jesus, what in the world are you doing? You don't do that. A woman and Samaritan? Yet no one said... What do you want, or why are you talking with her? So Jesus, in this moment, he sees this woman. Now, just before that, he also saw her sin. He's talking with her, and he, he points out to her, you know, the, one that you're li the man you're living with right now is not your husband. And you've had a, a number of other husbands. And, and so there are two things that Christ sees here as they pertain to us and racism. And it simply boils down to see it. See the people who are suffering and dealing with it and see it for the sin that it really is. This goes back to my stories that I opened with. I think for many people, we have become desensitized to the sin and occurrence of racism. Whether it's because we're so used to it and therefore it just kind of all blends together and we don't see it anymore, or because when we see it, we try to say that it is something else. But something that I want to explain to the church is that racism is still here. I know that we elected a black president, and I know that we fought a war to end slavery, and I know that some of you say you do not see color of someone, and I know also your intent in saying that. I know what you intend to say is that you will not always assume something about someone just because of the color of his or her skin. I know that because I used to say it. But then I learned something. Let's take that phrase, I don't see color, and let's apply it to something else. If I walk into a store and I'm greeted by the person there, and the person's like, well, hello, ma sir or ma'am or whatever you are, I don't see gender. Now, I know, unfortunately, that's a, fr that's a statement that we'll probably start to hear soon, um, but that's a sermon for another week here in the summer. How would I respond if I walked into a store and they were like, I don't know, are you a guy or a girl? Like, what do you mean? Can you not tell that I am a man? And being a man means that I have certain experiences in life. I want you to know, I would be offended if somebody came up to me and was like, guy, girl, don't know, don't care, I don't see gender. Believe it or not, what I, what I learned through this past year, there are a lot of people who want you to see their color. They want you to recognize who they are because with that goes a certain experience, both good and bad. So to dismiss it and say, well, I don't see it, you're dismissing the person and their experience. So see the people around you for who they are. 
And I don't think I have to do too much convincing that racism and prejudice and bigotry are sins, but in case there's any question about it, just ask yourself this. Does having a prejudiced, racist, or bigoted thought about someone honor God? Is God pleased by it? And let's be clear, folks. You know when you have a racist thought. I mean, sometimes there are, there's just like, oh, I didn't see it that way. I didn't realize what I was saying. I get that. Sometimes we, we just are unaware. But I have been privy to those conversations that white people have when they think it's safe to say what is really on their minds and on their hearts. You know when you have these racist attitudes and you know that they are not honoring to God. So see the sin of racism for what it is. It's a sin. And once we see that it's a sin, what do we do with it? We treat it like any other sin. Uh, again, just for the, the sake of, uh, of correlation here, let's remove sin from this, or I'm sorry, race from this argument. There are sins in this world that people are trying to excuse right now, correct? You know what? Anyone should be allowed to marry. We should be allowed to marry as many people as we want. It's my body and I choose to abort. I don't love the person anymore, so I need out of this marriage. Christians, how do we typically respond when we hear someone trying to argue away a sin? And yet so many people in the white evangelical world want to argue away their sin of racism. Why are we doing this? For those who love God, when we see sin, we deal with it. We, we don't make excuses about it. We don't, we don't look at another sin and say, well, was it really that? We repent of it. We lovingly bring it to the attention of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that brings us to our next point. We, we see the sin of racism and we see the people who are dealing with it. But the second one, Let's think back to the story of Jesus healing the Roman centurion's servant. Um, Caleb, I know it's on the fly here, but Matthew 8, 5 to 13, if you're able to pull those verses up. Matthew 8, 5 to 13. Uh, when he, Jesus, entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. He said to him, Am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you that many will come from east and west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, Go as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. So again, at first reading, you might wonder, where, where am I getting this race stuff from with this particular story? Realize that, that when this was happening, the author intended, he it purposefully said, this was a Roman soldier that Jesus was ministering to. And the other part that we have to, we, typically when we hear this story, we think, oh, you know, it's, it's a great story about faith. It's a great story about Jesus' power. But Jesus makes the connection here to say to the Jewish people, look, there's going to be a bunch of other people coming in here, and you guys might be left out. So it's time to check your hearts and make sure that you're honoring God. We cannot forget something about the context of Jesus and the people of Israel at this time. They were an occupied nation. Rome was in charge. They were the invading force that came into Israel to, in order to conquer it and control it. 
The Israelites were praying for the Messiah, the one who would come from God in order to rescue them from Roman control. Rome and the Romans were the enemies. And this story is not just about a random Roman citizen. It's a Roman soldier, a leader of Roman soldiers, a man with some authority. So this Roman soldier comes to Jesus, asks for healing of his servant, but he also recognizes the cultural expectations of that time. And this is why this story is so extraordinary on two different um, counts. Romans looked down upon the Jews. So for a Roman leader to ask a Jew for help, that is significant in and of itself. And then the Roman centurion, he acknowledges there, is, there was this custom with the Israelites where they would not go into a foreigner's home. For the, they, they wanted to be careful that they would not um, accidentally eat food that, had, that was not kosher or that had been sacrificed to an idol. So in order to save themselves from that sin, they just wouldn't go into people's homes. So this Roman official tells Jesus that he recognizes real authority. And all that it would take was for Jesus to heal this servant. Um, and all that it would take was Christ to simply say the word and this man, this servant, would be healed. And then Jesus says this in verse 10. Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. Are you starting to see some of the racial and societal over, um, overtures here uh, in this particular verse? Jesus is speaking to Jews and he tells them, this man who is not of your race is more faithful than anyone else in, is in Israel. This was yet another example, not just of Jesus' power over all things, but also of his teaching that all are welcomed into God's grace. And Jews should no longer look down upon these Gentiles um, because this one's faith that you look down upon is greater than all of those in Israel. Jesus is speaking against assumptions and ungodly thinking of the Jewish people here. Christians, do we need to do the same with regard to racism? Do we speak against assumptions and ungodly thinking that can sometimes prevail in our conversations? Do you just let wrong thinking go unchallenged? Are you aware when it happens? Are you looking for it? A couple of months ago, we had some visitors here from out of state. We had some local pastors, uh, we, we brought uh, some others in from out of state, and we, had, we hosted a dinner for them. And during the dinner, one of the guests from the other state here began this, he, he began to go down this all too familiar road of overt or covert, you know, stealthy racism. He, his complaint was that maybe, and this is one that you may have heard, we don't need to talk about race because all people are the same. All they need is the gospel. And as he was saying it, I was sitting there and then he broke into, what's the children's song about the colors? They all, God loves all the little children, the color thing. As he's singing it, I'm sitting there thinking like, wait, is this really happening right now? A Christian leader from elsewhere coming into our church and saying that we should just ignore the sin of racism. And in that moment, I froze. I didn't know what to say. Have you ever been in a situation where you are so mystified by the ignorance coming out of someone's mouth that all you could do was sit there and be like, Ugh. like, really? And you didn't know what to say. That was me in that moment. And to my church, I can promise you, that will not be my response in the future. As your pastor, as your sheepdog, remember, there's only one shepherd of the church. The pastor is not the shepherd of the flock. He is the sheepdog. As your sheepdog, I will stand with you. I will defend you. I will lovingly come alongside you and push you to get 
help you get walking in God's ways. I will speak out against sin, including the sin of racism. And please understand something. I know no one is running around here with white robes or adopting a skinhead lifestyle and belief system. But please know that racism is still happening in our country, it is still happening in our denomination, and it is still happening in this church. Just a couple of weeks ago, I'm not sure if you heard about this story breaking, but a leader in the Southern Baptist Church, um, who's now resigned and left, he released a letter that detailed some of the sins from on high of the executive board of the denomination. These are the people, they have say over the denomination, like it's this weird thing with us where they have say over the denomination, but they really can't do anything to the local church. Uh, it, it's the way that we have our agreements, other than maybe embarrass us or inspire us. One of the stories from his letter, and please note, none of us were there, so we cannot say with certainty that this conversation happened exactly as it was recorded. But according to the letter, one of the men who is responsible for leading the SBC, um, they, they were talking about this thing that had happened in the 80s and 90s in our denomination called the conservative resurgence, where theologically, um, 60s, 70s, like the, the SBC was becoming more liberal. And so these conservative theologians came together, they got control of the seminaries, they got control of leadership, and they were able to keep the SBC, thankfully, from drifting down into um, liberal theology. But in that discussion, the leader remarked that that fight the conservative resurgence, that fight was a lot like the Civil War, except this time the right side won. So a leader in the SBC saying, you know, during the Civil War, the South was the right side and regretting their loss. This was just a year or two ago that he said this. That is, if you've ever wondered what institutional racism is, that's it in a nutshell. When you have someone who is that high in authority saying things like that, that is institutional racism. It's not something that we have to look back to the 1950s to see. We only have to look back to pre-COVID to see it alive and well. I shared a couple of weeks ago about our denomination. So please do not see the sin and stupidity of one person even if he is a leader, jade your thinking and assume that all of us or most of us think that way. Because what I can also point out to you is this past week at our recent annual meeting, yes, there were still a lot of dumb things said at this annual meeting. That's normal, unfortunately. But many were also standing and speaking out against the sin of racism, including the leaders from the stage. And they were saying that we have allowed the sin of racism to fester for too long in the church and that it's not welcome here anymore. I would encourage you as a side note, if you're looking to hear some good things that SBC leaders would say, just do a search, 2021 annual meeting addressed by J.D. Greer. And I'll tell you, I think one of the reasons I liked his message is because he stole like a lot of the things I said the last two weeks, and I like it when leaders copy me. But seriously speaking, I believe that your heart will be blessed and your spirit encouraged or convicted by listening to his message. Okay, so our time's winding down here very quickly. Look with me to the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, again, Sorry for not getting the verses to you. Luke 10, Luke 10, verses 30 to 37, please. Luke 10, 30 to 37. Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. 
A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. Now, I've already spoken about the Samaritans as a people, so there's no need to rehash that right now. Jesus, he taught this parable for a reason. Part of it was to put the religious leaders and the pious people in their place. Oh, you know what? You think you're so good, you're so holy, and yet here comes this man that you look down upon. You know, that, th those people that you whisper about when they pass by, those people that you see as less than human, yet it was from one of those people who did the godly thing here. And what is the godly thing? Again, verses 36 to 37. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Mercy is a godly thing. So what is mercy? Like, have you ever just stopped and oh, if you had to define mercy, how would you define it? Here is the biblical definition. Kindness or goodwill towards the afflicted. Joining them with a desire to help them. Kindness or goodwill towards the afflicted. Joining them with a desire to help them. So what does it mean to be a neighbor and show mercy to someone? It means to show kindness and goodwill towards one who is afflicted by joining with them for the purpose of helping them. Church, is it time that you become a neighbor to those in your church, in your workplaces, in our communities, maybe even in our own families? You know, the Christian church has this long, beautiful history of coming alongside the afflicted and being a presence and support to those who are hurting, including dealing with acts of racism. Unfortunately, the Christian church also has a long, ugly history of perpetuating, encouraging, and turning a blind eye towards those who are seen as other, as different, or as three-fifths of a person. And I know that there are those who bow to the idol of talk radio talking points who are upset that I would even have a sermon like this right now. Pastor, what are you talking about? Just talk about Jesus, man. Race is a distraction. And I know that sometimes, you know, the, we, we, we see the militant, angriest voices that get picked up in the media, and it's easy to think that just because this black man or black woman is on TV saying something, then he or she must be speaking for all of them. I hope that you can stop and realize how naive and thoughtless it is to think that one person who is given a microphone can speak for an entire race of people. So rather than associate the person you see or hear on TV or the radio whose voice is blowing up right now, stop and think about those that you worship with. Stop and think about those that you smile when you see them that you enjoy hearing from them in a Bible study, whose prayers you love to know are covering over you at any given moment. Do you realize that there are people in our own church, in our workplaces, in our family, who are hurting right now? And we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, have the opportunity, the calling, the expectation, and the honor of coming alongside them to show them you are no longer alone in this affliction. You do not have to look just to people that look like you. 
please look to your church. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, know that we stand with you and that we desire to show care and mercy. I came across this quote while studying for this message, and it's not necessarily about race, but I wanted to share it because it speaks to what the church should be. It was written by a name, uh, a man, his, his name is Clement of Rome. He lived from 35 to 99 AD. So we're talking like first generation Christian here. He was one of the leaders, in fact, he was considered the Pope uh, of Rome. And he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church. So he wrote a letter to the church, the same church that Paul wrote a letter to not long after they would have received it from Paul. And this is what he had to say. He's talking about how the church stands with one another and how the church shows care and mercy to each other. He, he said this, We know many among ourselves who have given themselves up to bonds in order that they might ransom others. The church in Corinth had Christians who were willing to be sold into slavery so that I could set my brother or sister free. That's the church. Many too have surrendered themselves to slavery, that with the price which they received for themselves they might provide food for others. The church in Corinth saw hungry people and they had no way to feed them other than to sell themselves. Now, yes, the, the slavery system was much different uh, th than what we are familiar with here in this country. They were willing to sell themselves into slavery to take that money to then feed the people around them. That is showing mercy. And that is what we, as the church, as followers of God, are called to do. I don't know, maybe, did they sit around and argue about, well, you, why are they hungry? Maybe they should get a job. Why are they in slavery? Well, you know, maybe they should, they should just pay off their debts. I don't know, but this is what the church did. And this is what the church needs to do once more, to have that same kind of commitment to showing mercy to those who are afflicted and joining with them for the purpose of helping them. Church, racism is a stain, is a sin whose stain upon us remains. But here's the thing, Christ can remove our sin from us and make us as white as snow. If there was ever a time for you to say amen, that's the, right there. So what can we do about this? I want to very quickly share what we can do, but also encourage you, if you are interested, uh, there's a book that I just started reading um, kind of in preparation for this sermon. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in it, you know, grab a copy, come and speak with me about it after you've read it. The book is called How to Fight Racism. And it's written by Jamar Tisby. It's the same guy who wrote uh, the book Color of Compromise. Part of my frustration over the last year was hearing all of these things about, you know, the, the history of racism in the, in the church and wanting to do something about it. Well, this book is that stage. It helps us to see here are some things you can do. I'm halfway through it already, and I've been encouraged so much by it. In the book, he shares three ways that we as the church can do something about the sin of racism. And he uses this acronym, ARC. A, awareness. That's what a lot of the sermon was about here. Know that sin is out there, that it is in here, and that it is in here. And once you are aware of it, then look for ways, the R, to build relationships with those of the opposite race. And I'm not just talking about, oh, you know what, I go to church with so-and-so. 
No, real relationships where you can talk freely, more than, you know, and I know your heart's in it, more than just a pleasant handshake and a smile, and I know that you're excited to see each other here, but I'm talking about something deeper than that, something where you can talk freely, experience new things, hear from one another, give to one another, and receive the blessing that goes along with not just being friendly, but actually being friends brothers and sisters, inviting people to your house, inviting yourself over to their house, cultivating real relationships and friendships with people. Yes, the enemy is going to make you question your motives in this right now. You're going to say, well, I don't know if I can invite that family over right now. They're going to know that I'm only doing it because the pastor talked about it. So, do it. <laughs> And I know that you will still be blessed and grow through cultivating relationships with everyone in this church and not just those that look like you. Folks, the issue of racism is one that only God through his people can change. No amount of sensitivity training or federal holidays, or even living in a multiracial neighborhood like I do, or like I did growing up in a multiracial neighborhood, no amount of that will help really make a change and deal with the sin of racism. Only Christ can, and only the church can make a real difference with this sin. And so it's time for the church to lead in eradicating this sin from within us personally. We have to do it here so that we can then work amongst ourselves and then go out into society. And I pray that you would be willing to join with me in repenting. And then here's the C in case you're like, oh, where's you? He, he said, Ark, where's the C? Committing committing to see God remove this sin like all sins from us, to be willing to speak out against it, to see it as a sin, to see uh, how God can work within us to be then a witness to the world. I shared a couple of months ago um, during a, a prayer time with some others uh, that someone had brought up in the book of Acts and how in, in the, the early church, one of the things that God used to spread his word initially was through signs and wonders. Now, we typically go to, oh, you know, they were praying in tongues, they were saying all these things, God was healing, doing all these incredible things. And I pointed out, I said, do you realize that in our culture right now, unity is a sign and a wonder? Unity is a miracle because you don't see it anywhere. So can we commit as the church to truly be united? Not just kind of like getting along, you know, we're happy to see each other, but truly united in our experience with one another. Can we be committed to see that unity grow in our church so that it can be a witness to the rest of the world? Before it even gets to the rest of the world, so that it could be a witness to the rest of the churches in our area. And then going out from there, I truly believe that God has blessed this church with the ability to go forward in this and to help be on the leading edge of showing other churches this is how this can be done. Stop with the, you know, the Japanese church and the black church and the, um, the Latino church and whatever else. Let's be the church. And let's be unified, united, truly united in Christ where we are willing to speak out against sin and see it at, or speak out against racism and see it as the sin it, that it is and being willing to stand with those who are dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis, stand with them, united in them, willing to show mercy and care all for God's honor.
Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us as your people, as your church, to have a better understanding, a, a better, um, I don't know, a more humble heart. God, that we would be able to hear your clear word about this issue. I know that on both sides of the issue that there is so much that has been said from a point of view that wants nothing to do with you. And God, I pray that you would help us to hear you in all of the rhetoric. God, help us to humbly turn to you. God, help us to repent. Repent of, of not seeing it. Repent of ignoring it. Repent of uh, trying to explain it away and not accepting that there is a sin that is running rampant in our world that has been, um, and many times we as the church, we encouraged it. God, help us to repent. And when I say repent, I'm talking about turning in the opposite direction from it. Instead of allowing it to, to fester or encouraging it outright, God, help us to address the sin in our own hearts, in our church, in our denominations, in our workplaces and families, neighborhoods, and everywhere else that you have called us, God. Help us to speak the truth in love against this sin that we may see your Holy Spirit pleased, working through us, seeing lives changed, seeing people discipled out of that sin and into a new life in you. And God, I pray for all of those in our church um, who do have to deal with this sin as the, uh, as the victims of it. God, I pray that you would remind them, or maybe not remind, but show them for the first time that they are a part of a church and a part of the family of God that wants to stand with them and say no more. We're not going to allow it. God, remind them that they are loved. Remind them that that we are here as your people. And God, I pray that you would give comfort and hope, Lord, as so many gathered yesterday for Juneteenth, and uh, God, I pray that, that you would remind us all of the, um, the great hope that is found in, in the celebration of that holiday, that, um, God, there is freedom out there, and so many of us are just unaware of it. God, I pray that you would help us as Rolling Hills Church, as your people, to be the ones who are willing to go out there and proclaim that there can be freedom from racism. God, give us the strength in our hearts to humbly submit to you, to be obedient to you, and to see you do a miraculous work in our lives, in the ministries of Rolling Hills Church, and the ministries of the churches around us. God, we pray that for your glory, that we could be the example 
And that we, we pray that for our community, that we could be the example of unity, that it would be a sign and wonder where, where people would look to us and say, how in the world are you doing this? How are you staying together? How, what keeps you on task with, with, with loving the community and loving one another? God, may everything that we do point to you and be the example to say that that other churches uh, can, can do more than what we are doing. And obviously, God, we recognize we as a church, we haven't arrived yet. There's still much that you want to teach us and show us. And I pray that we would always be willing as your people to humbly submit to your teaching, to your correction, to your encouragement, and to your authority as the head over our church, Christ. Continue to help us grow towards unity. And Father God, we look forward to that glorious day when your church, not Rolling Hills Church, but your church is gathered in eternity where we can be a part of that choir from every nation, from every tongue, from every tribe, who are gathered singing your praises for all that you have done. May you do that work in our lives right now, and may you help us to do that work throughout the rest of our lives, sharing your gospel, sharing your love, discipling with one another, that we may all encourage each other to grow in your grace. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Will you please stand?